Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome back to another episode of the Reliability Matters podcast. For those of you who are counting, this is episode number 126. Moisture. The industrial world has been fighting moisture since the beginning of the industrial world. From a general point of view, moisture leads to issues such as mold and mildew, rust, wood rot, damage to building materials, microbial growth, and so much more. In the electronics world specifically, moisture creates a host of reliability problems, including popcorning, delamination of conformal coating, corrosion, electrochemical migration, adhesion degradation, such as on labels and glues, and so much more. I wanted to dive into moisture mitigation, so I invited two guests onto my show to discuss this very topic. Dan Jenkins is the sales manager and partner for The Steel Camel, and yes, I will ask him about that name, an industrial solutions company specializing in corrosion and water intrusion control for fuel systems and industrial equipment. Prior to Steel Camel, Dan worked as a consultant and instructor in the crane accident prevention industry. He has consulted to large organizations such as Shell Oil and the United States Department of Interior. Dan earned an MBA from the University of South Florida and earned his bachelor's in industrial arts and technology from California State University, Chico, and his post-secondary teaching credential from San Francisco State University. My other guest, Bob Lowry, has both a bachelor's and a master's degree in chemistry. His experience includes 31 years as a senior scientist and lab manager for three integrated circuit manufacturing companies, where measurement of moisture and moisture control activities were a major part of the services he provided. He has 20 years of experience consulting in the microelectronics industry on a wide variety of topics, including materials analysis and measurements and methods of moisture control for electronic components. Here's my conversation with Dan Jenkins and Bob Lowry. Hi, guys. Hello. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being my guest, guests today. Uh, let's, let's talk about moisture, shall we? Let's do it. I, I, think, uh, I think that's what we're here for. Um, Dan, let me start with you. You're the sales manager and partner uh, of Steel Camel. I can't let that name go by without asking you, uh, where did that name, company name, come from, Steel Camel? I was in the crane business, and the original name of my company was Iron Ox. And the, <laughs> You're sticking with ox, mammals here. Yeah. So the ox was the the first crane. The, fir the very first crane was an ox pulling a rope with a pulley and causing things to go up and down. But the ox never called in sick, never filed a worker's comp claim, those type of things. So it was just a steady, hardworking animal trying to get the job done over many, many years. And so I, 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 I relate to work in tough, dangerous applications. So uh, the crane, the iron ox, the steel camel is all about, my background is heavy equipment. So that's where it came Okay. From. All right. I am always intrigued by company names. Uh, sometimes okay. it's just the name of the founder, and sometimes it has a, a, a little bit of a history to it. Um, and I always appreciate hearing what that history is. Uh, How would you get started in the um, w with a background in construction equipment, heavy equipment, cranes, mm -hmm. things like that? How what what attracted you to the moisture? Uh, oh my God! World? So I was an accident investigator. So forklifts going off loading docks, or forklifts ramming into things inside of a building, and um, uh, forklifts running over people, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I studied why things break and why things fail and why accidents happen. And eventually, I got into the crane business. And I studied uh, and I became passionate about preventing crane accidents. So I worked with engineers and reliability engineers who studied failure analysis on the crane. And my job was to take that information, go to the client and prevent the next accident from happening. So you didn't repeat the same crane accident. And along the way, I got into a little company called Shell Oil. And they had accidents offshore oil rigs that shut down an oil rig at half a million dollars an hour, okay? And a lot of them were related to rust and corrosion. And a lot of the rust and corrosion was underneath the coating. How about that? And a lot of the rust and corrosion was inside the wire rope where you couldn't see it from the exterior. 
And so that's how I got into the moisture business by understanding corrosion on heavy equipment and which eventually led me to corrosion problems. So wherever there's corrosion, water's not too far behind. So it doesn't matter if it's a gas tank, a gun safe. Uh, and then we started applying this technology to electronics and mostly electrical junction boxes. So anything that's hot outside, cold inside, gets moisture and it condenses on parts and things happen. And the circuit board industry is no different. Yes, yes, that's a, a battle that we've been fighting since the beginning of circuit assemblies, and even more so now that the um, miniaturization has kind of uh, made the components so close together and the conductors so close together that even smaller amounts of moisture that would otherwise not be problematic are now, you know, it's now showing his ugly head in, 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 in the term mm -hmm. of electrochemical migration and parasitic leakage, things like that. But before we drop down those those this conversation is going to be littered with rabbit holes. But before we drop down that rabbit hole, I'm going to try and stay on terra firma here. Uh, Bob Lowry, um, you are also a subject matter expert on the, on moisture. Uh, how did you stumble into in, into that or fall down that rabbit hole? Well, I was hired right out of college by an integrated circuit manufacturing company here in Florida, and. Um, the reason I was hired was not because of my electrical background. In fact, at the time, I didn't know much more about electronics than Ohm's Law. But I did have a chemistry uh, education. And this company was building integrated circuits uh, using electrical engineers. And as you probably know, building ICs and building printed circuit boards and so on. It's, it's really a problem in, in chemistry and physics. So the company needed somebody that maybe, you know, do a little bit <laughs> about materials composition and failure modes and those kind of things. And obviously, as Dan has talked about, you know, moisture is a major contributor to, to certain failure modes in the electronics industry. Um, sort of unlike Dan, who comes at this from the big heavy equipment uh, angle, I come at it more from the, the uh, much smaller scale angle of uh, electronic components and even what's inside electronic components. Uh, how to find out how much moisture is there, how to measure it, and then how to, to mitigate it, uh, lessen it, and protect components uh, from moisture failure. Mode. So that, that's kind of my, my background. Excellent. I'll share a couple of anecdotes uh, just to get the conversation started. Um, one is just um, uh, kind of a new story of the last, the last uh, uh, eight or 10 years. And then one is a personal story that happened in my factory, and I'll save that one for a little later. Um, the you know, Boeing introduced you know, its newest airliner, which is the 787, which they call the Dreamliner. And one of the um, industry firsts is that the fuselage and the wings are largely carbon fiber, as opposed to aluminum and other you know, metallic substances. And the cost of carbon fiber is pretty expensive compared to metal, and, and very labor-intensive, time-consuming to build. Um, but the advantage was twofold. One is it's lighter, so the aircraft is more fuel-efficient, which these days sells aircraft, right, because with the cost of fuel. Uh, and the other, uh, which you know, I hadn't really thought about, was uh, better corrosion mitigation, because carbon fiber doesn't corrode, you know, at least not like metal does. And one of the advantages to uh, passengers is that uh, they're able to increase the humidity level within the cabin. And you know, if you think about it, whenever you fly, I fly a lot, I travel all the time. And you know, if you're on a long flight, your, your skin gets dry, you know, your throat may feel dry uh, because the relative humidity inside that plane is purposely kept very low because the last thing any airline wants is for the fuselage to start corroding, you know, from the inside or the outside. Uh, so that, that's one of the advantages of, of um, this particular type of aircraft and some other newer Airbus as well, is that uh, they can increase the humidity level. Uh, the other thing they can do is increase the, uh, or decrease the, increase rather the pressurization so it doesn't feel like you're, you know, quite as high as you, as you actually are. So, um, uh, you know, that's just a, you know, modern example of industries going to the extreme to mitigate corrosion. In this case, they didn't figure out how to stop metal from corroding. They just figured out how to largely stop using metal. 
uh, and they just kind of ducked the whole problem. Um, let's uh, talk about uh, moisture in the terms of, um, it's, it's the root of many evils, it's the root of many reliability issues uh, over vast industries. And for today's conversation, I want to kind of divide it into two sections, and we'll, we'll weave in between the two. One is in general terms, moisture and corrosion and other manifestations of, of moisture in the general field. So that could be airlines or metallic things and uh, whatever. And then, and then we'll talk specifically about uh, moisture issues and mitigation strategies within the electronic assembly space and, and component space for that matter. So let's start with um, the, the, the general uh, moisture conversation. Dan, I think that's right up your alley. Um, we, we all uh, know metals that can fall victim uh, to moisture, some faster than others. Uh, Dan, what's your, uh, what types of moisture mitigation strategies do your customers outside of the electronics industry seek? Uh, I, I know that's a wide, that's a big question with, with a lot of different answers, but, but what, what are the general um, issues that your customers have and what types of strategies are you recommending? Um, I'll start with what I think is a, uh, a not, I, I'll start with hot rod painting, okay? Uh, Americans are obsessed with gloss, they're obsessed with shiny cars, they're obsessed with good looking paint jobs, and to get a good looking paint job, you have to have paint with no moisture in it. As soon as you get a little moisture in the paint, the finish is dull. and uh, so moisture coming through compressed airlines is a is an everyday occurrence because it's hot outside, it's colder inside, it condenses the 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 the, the air is traveling, it warms up. When you turn the compressor off, it cools down. You get condensate, and they spray it out their gun, and that's a common general uh, moisture problem. Is people that paint with compressed air. I would say that's a a big one because no one wants paint peeling, paint bubbling right? No one wants streaks in their paint job. So that, that's one that I deal with. Um, I would say, have you ever driven down the road, Mike, and seen a, I know you're in California, but you ever seen black smoke coming out of an exhaust pipe in your earlier days? You ever see a mini bike with black smoke coming out the back? Of well, a, yeah. Uh, whenever I follow a diesel, um, uh, you usually see that. But yes, I have seen that. Yeah. Well, that's related to water in the fuel that's unburnt. Okay, so it's it's spitting out, it's exhausting fuel out the exhaust pipe, which is black, and it goes up. Since you're in Southern California, you've seen smog before in your earlier days, right? I have no idea what you're talking about, Dan. <laughs> 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 yes, particularly, uh, you know, I'm the child of the, of the 60s. So, you know, yeah. when I was in high school in the 70s, there were times when we, we couldn't, we couldn't go out, outside for uh, PE because the air Correct. was just so brown. Correct. And that's, uh, people fight that. And I grew up in San Francisco, uh, right above the San Francisco airport, by the way. And you could see Oakland clear as a bell, 20 miles directly across the bay. Clear. You could tell every building. You look to San Jose, you're lucky if you could see one building. <laughs> okay. Right. Why? Because there's water in the air and, wa and fuel and they mix and they the ozone holds it down and creates smog. So that's another one of moisture mitigation. And um, I would say hydraulic oil is a common one. People with tractors and cranes and bulldozers, they uh, have an enclosed space. It's hotter outside, it's cooler inside, condenses, and uh, you get diffused moisture, believe it or not, in a hydraulic oil. And it's the same diffused water that's in a circuit board. Not, the water's the same, okay? H2O. So that's yeah. how I approach it. And, and so those are the um, some of the moisture related issues, the motivation to solve those issues. Uh, what are some of the okay, I have a I have an oil platform and, yeah. and uh, in the North Sea, and I want to make sure that it doesn't corrode any faster than its you know predicted mm -hmm. life. Uh, what types of strategies are you know considered? Uh, mainstream, and what type of strategies, from your perspective, that might be more novel, uh, that are not part of the mainstream, but 
you know, Dan's got a better idea, that type of thing. Is, 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 uh, is that a relevant question? Yes, I'll start with the controversial one, okay? Good. Uh, I think conformal coatings um, have problems. Uh, I've been in the hot rod business. I've painted a lot of things in my life or been around it and coating a circuit board that's vibrating all the time on an oil platform is not a good idea. They crack and moisture goes through the coating and now you've trapped moisture up against the electronics and it's buried by a coating. And I've inspected a lot of cranes in my day and you open up the control panel and it's toast, okay? <laughs> because the moisture's got in there and trying to use a barrier I don't think it's such a good idea. That's my like, I think I'm reading Bob's mind right now. Conformal yeah, coating I, is permeable. It doesn't bar moisture. But go ahead, Bob. Uh, take over. Yeah, I, I, just to jump in with a quick story. Um, when Elon Musk first started launching uh, Falcon 9 rockets, um, one day they had one on the pad down here in Florida. Uh, they had a, before the launch, they had a really heavy rainstorm like we're having right now out the window here. <laughs> so moisture is an appropriate topic. Yes. Anyway, the, the um, rocket, the antenna on the rocket started giving all kinds of anomalous data to the control center. So Elon and one of his engineers went out to the rocket, climbed up, took a uh, panel off the side of the rocket where this antenna was, and it was loaded with water. The antenna and the printed circuit boards uh, in that compartment were not sealed off from the outside environment, and the rainstorm put a lot of water in there. So to, to fix that problem, they went and got a hair dryer, and they, they blew off all the water that they could off the printed circuit boards, and then uh, slathered all those boards with silicone. Uh, you know, silicone in stuff they got, I don't know where they got it, got it out of a barrel or a drum or something. Uh, did that, put the panel back on, the rocket launched fine the next day, no problem. But the moral to the story is exactly what you hinted at a few minutes ago. It depends on the silicone. Some silicones are a reasonably good barrier, but others are not. The, you know, moisture will get through them readily, and some of them actually source moisture themselves. And so if you coat an electronic component or something else with that silicone, you're, you're asking for trouble. So. Um, if you want to use silicones, you can take a look at them, but it's best to qualify the material before you actually use it. Yeah. Adding to, um, we're like a bunch of old veterans at the VFW comparing foxhole stories here, but adding to uh, the analogy, uh, I was hired as an expert witness several years ago in a uh, civil lawsuit where an OEM was suing their contract manufacturer, basically for, for following their directions. They said, well, the directions were faulty, but you should have known better. You're the pros. Um, and this particular device was going to be planted into the ground in parking lots and streets uh, a, a few feet under the ground and, uh, and operated by a battery because they were, it was not connected to an exterior power source and it had a little radio that would signal certain things uh, to a receiver that was connected to a permanent power source. Uh, so they're basically little radio transmitters and, and sensors under the ground. And uh, because it was going underground, they considered that a harsh environment, so they, uh, they, didn't, they potted the boards. They didn't conformally coat the boards. They potted the boards in silicone and put them in a plastic box with an O-ring around it you know, that was not quite hermetically sealed, but sealed. And they had all sorts of problems. The battery started failing within six months. It's supposed to be a 10-year battery life. It started failing within six months. And, and then, you know, my team was hired to, to figure out what was going on. And, you know, we contracted with some analytical laboratories. And, of course, they had dendritic growth and uh, parasitic electrical leakage and uh, some elements of corrosion, although corrosion wasn't the primary cause. It was just a symptom. And uh, it turned out that they did not bake their boards prior to coating. They were cleaning their boards with a water-based cleaner, a conveyorized water-based cleaner with an air knife blow-off. So it just blew off the surface moisture. Uh, they didn't have a first in first out inventory control system for their bare boards and they didn't have a dry box. They didn't even know what a dry box was. Uh, so, you know, over the, the time, the boards were fabricated in China, you know, put on a ship and, and, and then stored in a hot warehouse. Um, the boards picked up moisture 
but they thought it's okay. We're going to pot the board, so you know we're we're good. Turned out they basically, uh, like like uh, King Tut, they created a sarcophagus with all of the the board's possessions, all the sins of the process trapped in. It did work for trapping things out. However, there was enough uh, ingredients for electrochemical migration in the potting. They actually were growing dendrites and had, had um, uh, shorts on the board and, and um, reductions in resistivity through parasitic electrical leakage within the potted and sealed boxed assembly. So they basically potted in the sins of the process. And they, they did not, that board did not receive moisture from the outside world once it was potted. However, it had enough in it already. So their moisture mitigation process started too late. Right, it was already there by the time they decided it would be a good idea to protect it. And I don't know if you've had experience similar to that before. Yeah, there. As an aside, uh, maybe a little bit off the topic, but there's a specification in the military system built standard eight eight three. It's test method fifty eleven, for what it's worth, and that test method tells you how to qualify, among other things, tells you how to qualify coatings. Um, for uh, how well they coat, how conformal they are, uh, how moisture resistant they are, or how dry they are inherently within themselves. And, and what's sad is that not many people in the industry ever implement that document to qualify the materials they're going to use that implement exactly the kind of problems you talked about. Yeah, and by the way, they also, in addition to uh, surface level dendritic growth, they also had uh, conduct conductive anodic filament. They had calf in between the layers of the board. Um, yeah. Again, because yeah. of moisture, and I think what most people don't realize, particularly in the electronic assembly world, is you know we, we mix up the term moisture. Uh, conformal coatings are really more fluid barriers than they are moisture barriers uh, in most cases. So if I were to right. take uh, this this Yeti filled with Diet Coke and pour it on my MacBook Pro below me. Uh, if that, if the boards below the keyboard were conformal coated, no big deal. Blow it off, and and it would still run. Um, however, if I were to have this computer set out in Miami in August or anywhere in the South in August uh, and run, uh, I could end up over time, uh, even if those assemb those boards were conformally coated, with some electrical issues. Not enough fluid penetration to create a short based on the fluid's electrical properties, conduct conductive properties, but enough to uh, create a, a reaction with residues and electrical bias to form the whole ECM event in the first place. So I think a lot of people don't realize that we have plenty of, of evidence and photographs of dendritic, dendrites growing under conformal coating, uh, and that requires moisture. You know, no moisture, no dendrite. So, you know, it's there, right? This is a smoking gun. What are the mitigating factors against growing dentrites has always been claimed to conformally coat the substrate because uh, by compressing it, you know, the dentrite can't grow. But it sure can if you have the damp conditions, even though the coating is there. So, again, we could go off on a bit of a tangent that there are a lot of, to me, preferable coatings besides silicones or the things you can get out of a can. Uh, thin film, deposited thin films like perylene and zirconium oxide are excellent barriers and try within themselves for, for that kind of protection. Yeah. Uh, um, Dan. If I could uh, jump yeah, in one second. Yeah, you know, sure. The, of course. The, uh, you know, the history of metal, the first, the Iron Age, they used to make uh, shields and swords, right? But the problem with them, they're strong, they're flexible, and they could kill people and do all kinds of good things. But the the problem was that they rusted, right? So for three, four thousand years, I don't know when's the bronze age, what was that, uh, ten thousand years ago or whatever. The um, they've always tried to coat the metal to put a barrier over the metal to protect it. And I just think there's new ways. You asked me about something new. There's just different ways to protect metal other than putting always putting a barrier over it. And then as soon as that barrier scratches or peels or or you know starts to degrade. Oh, then recode it, right? How many times are you going to recode it, right? So there's right. there's other ways to mitigate other than constantly putting a barrier. So sure. 
you know, I do a lot of, my wife and I like to go on cruises. We, we do quite a few cruises. And uh, on every cruise, pretty much, if you're on there for long enough, you'll see some, some deckhand, you know, with a paintbrush and a roller. And, and they're, they're leaning over the side painting the ship, particularly when yeah. they're at dock. You know, they're just constantly yeah. painting the ship. Uh, I grew up in the San Francisco area. And I remember there were always uh, paint crews on the Bay Bridge and the Gold Gate Bridge. And, and sure. back in the day, the Dumbarton Bridge. Uh, yeah. You know, they were constantly painting that thing. Oh. One of the uh, things I read about, Dan, that you've, you're promoting um, reminds me of if you're having a barbecue in the backyard and you don't want flies or other insects invading, uh, you, you, you can put out, you know, a bowl of fruit or something and put it 100 feet away or, or something. And that, that, if there's bugs in the area, they'll be attracted to that. It's basically an offering to the insect gods, right? Um, you have something that you call uh, you refer to as a moisture magnet and That's that kind of reminds me of the you know the, the bowl of sacrificial uh, fruit uh, to keep the insects there instead of where you are it, it, am I oversimplifying that or is that, that uh, well, kind of the strategy um, I love that I could go back to the origins when I began to look at the circuit board industry I went to my first conference PCB West by the way in Santa Clara California very nice place and uh my first day looking at this industry, everybody who was displaying, every I mean everybody who was displaying there, had silica gel beads and humidity indicator cards. But not many people could tell me what they actually did, okay? And um, through research, I found out that a lot of parts absorb more moisture than the humidity indicator card. So the, the card is giving you a false reading because the card's not picking up the moisture, but the part is. And so we have, a different, we have a different method to deal with the moisture inside the bag, which is very important because we actually attract the moisture and pull it into the bag, not just moisture sticking to it and then uh, eventually falling off and going back right onto the board. So that's a that's a big change, a big difference than what the current methods are. So when I think about something that is is um, hydrophilic, that that just really wants to absorb moisture, I think of desiccant. Um, you know, any time I get a prescription, it always has that little desiccant uh, container in it, or or uh, mm -hmm. many things have that. Um, is is desiccant a specific material, or is, there, is that just kind of a general, generic term for something that absorbs moisture? Uh, and if so, if it is a specific material, are there better materials to use to pack with things that are moisture sensitive, for example, than just a plain old desiccant? Uh, 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 let me answer that question. So, desiccants weren't around. Uh, the history of desiccants, I mean, in modern era, is when they came back from World War II, a lot of the equipment was rusted. A lot of the electronics, the original electronics from these planes were all rusted. And they, so they began in the 50s to look at ways how to mitigate moisture inside, in, inside planes, inside boxes, inside ammo boxes, right? And um, at the time, the only thing that was available was, was basically dried sand, okay? And so if you lo open up a desiccant pack that you get in your pill bottle, right, or your beef jerky, right, or your wife's leather purse, people collect these desiccant bags, right? Have you seen, Mike, where people collect the desiccant bags? Sure. Well, if you well, I mean, I, I, I only collect them, uh, at, you know, in, in my pocket so I can throw them all away. I don't, throw them all I don't away. have a desiccant bag collection. Yes, you have a but people have a desiccant bag collection. And... But if you cut it open and look inside, what is it, right? It's either a, basically a small marble, right, a, a piece of glass. It's sometimes clay, which is basically dirt. And other times it's these um, zeolite or some kind of activated uh, material that has a gazillion little holes in it. And they will hold, they will, to their credit, they will hold moisture and reduce humidity. And so yeah. is the reason for the zillion little holes just to increase the surface area so it has correct. more that is correct. absorption so, area? So the, 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 the moisture, the humidity level does go down, okay? Let's give credit where credit due. The humidity level goes down. 
but that was determined in 1951. Okay, they still use that same formula today. So all you're doing is lowering the humidity, but the moisture is still there. The H2O molecule is still there. And we've been taught, we haven't even got into micro, micro, microbes yet. Hopefully we could touch on that, but uh, they're active in the circuit board industry. Microbes are active in the circuit board industry. And when you have moisture and microbes, that's a recipe for growth. That's how mushrooms grow, right? That's how bacteria grows. That's how marijuana grows. That's how plants grow. That's how weeds grow, right? It's, it's moisture and bacteria and they grow and they do damage. And just in case my audience is getting any ideas, you cannot grow marijuana on your circuit boards. <laughs> that, that, that technology is not there yet. That's not they a symptom of too much moisture. They, yes. Right. Plenty of other places to get that. So if, if we were to drag the people who are still, their head is still in the 1950s with mm -hmm. standard stereotypical mm -hmm. desiccant materials, uh, and we brought them into your world, what mm -hmm. kind of materials would they see? We have uh, absorbing, absorbing, AB, absorbing polymers, much like a diaper, but the diaper, uh, has, this diaper type material has much different properties than a diaper for a, a baby. For my audience's sake, explain the difference between adsorbing, A, D, alpha, delta, and absorbing, uh, absorbing, alpha, bravo. Explain mm -hmm. what those differences are. So adsorbing with the D is the moisture adheres to the substrate. So it adheres to the silica gel bead. You put in, a, for argument's sake, 100,000 silica gel beads in a bag, right? There's a lot of beads in there, right? You have, you have tremendous surface area but the moisture basically just sticks to it. It adheres, but when it reaches saturation, it falls off. It can't absorb anymore. It can't adsorb anymore. A sponge- So it's, it's, so it's here into the surface. It's not going into the material. It's like a sponge correct. would, for example, it's, it's, or flour mixed with water, you know, that's correct. absorbing, right? Correct, correct. Okay. And, and, and when you get into the devils in the detail of microbiologically influenced corrosion, which we're talking about, the H2O molecule is still there. The, 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 the ability to create corrosion and to increase the bacteria count is still there. Because the, the water's still there. It's just adhered to the piece of clay or the piece of rock, if I call it, sand. And ours is so different. Ours is a polymer that sucks it in and, and neutralizes it and makes it inert. So that's a big difference. So I go from the 1950s world to Bob's world which is in the present, uh, and, and you know he has controversial ways to, to uh, mitigate moisture. Um, is your controversial way, to use your words, um, just different desiccant material that's maybe more efficient or more, more, more effective? Is it something that like no one's thought of before? Maybe it came from another industry, but it's really good at, at, at reducing the moisture, you know, the humidity level, or whatever the case may be. What, what is the... the I mean, outside of trade secrets, obviously. Yeah. What's the What's the difference? What am I going to see traveling in time from the 1950s to now? Uh, well, a couple things. So, uh, yes, we we deal with corrosion, and, and 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 we our technology will expand. So that's a big difference. So in a in a desiccant bead, they rely on it changing color to identify when it's saturated. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? Yes. No, I didn't know that, but yeah, they they could either change that's too color. Too far down my rabbit hole. Okay, so sometimes they change color, but the mill spec doesn't allow for color changes. So then you get into measuring weight, right? And um, okay, and then they or they put in what's called a humidity indicator card in the bag. I'm, you're familiar yeah. with those, I'm sure. That, yes. Those I've seen many times. Yeah, and they change colors, and it's time to change the bag, or they actually bake it for 16 hours. By the way, um, our technology is different. Ours will expand and grow and, 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 and triple and quadruple in size and blow up like the Pillsbury Doughboy. And so the operator knows, hey, I'm getting moisture. I'm getting moisture. I, I need to pay attention. I, I, got, I got issues, right? I got mine blowing up. That means I'm getting moisture. And it could be, you know, the humidity levels in the, in the warehouse. It could be, it would travel on a truck. It could be in the bottom of an airplane. Okay. So, uh, bunch of thermal cycling will, will, will add to condensation and ours ours recognize ours pulls it in and it blows it up and so that's a big change for everybody 
Interesting. Bob, let's go back to electronics. I'm, I, I've worked with, um, I work a lot with, you know, I'm on the board of directors for SMTA, and as such, I work with a lot of chapters that produce uh, webinars, and, and I produced a webinar for them on uh, uh, moisture-sensitive devices. It was their MSD council. And uh, so I got to learn a little bit about, you know, the, the different uh, classifications of moisture compatibility, if you will, with, with certain devices. Um, what's the difference, if there is any, between the known standards for moisture sensitive devices versus the entire assembly? Is there a different, differenti differentiation there? Uh, is it simply an extension of, you know, if you have one moisture sensitive device that is the highest level of sensitivity, does that just apply to now the entire assembly? Uh, you know, is there a crossover between the, the device itself and then the actual assembly, if that question makes sense, hopefully. Yeah, no, it does, and there can be differences. And when it comes to moisture, it's, it's sort of inexorably tied to and also related to temperature. Uh, how much moisture is there around and at what temperatures um, uh, are applied to the product. Uh, and in addition to that, the dew point. Uh, if the, the dew point temperature is the one where moisture will actually condense out of the atmosphere and land on surfaces and then sit there as, as an as adsorbed material, but liquid, liquid material. Um, so there are different uh, areas of sensitivity. Uh, it depends on the device type. <laughs> It depends on the lifetime you expect out of the device. There's actually a, some math that um, is kind of daunting, but it's called the I-ring relationship, uh, E-Y-R-I-N-G, which uh, takes into consideration time, temperature, uh, relative humidity, and is a way to calculate, or at least uh, estimate, uh, how long something, uh, some electronic component will last depending on how much time, temperature, and humidity it's exposed to. So there is some rather difficult science to that. Um, I don't have the software that, uh, you know, computes with the hiring relationship, but there are laboratories that do. And um, that's what um, people will generally do, is expose their product to different uh, amounts of time, temperature, and relative humidity, and see what fails and see at what point in the exposure time they fail. Do they, do they fail a month from now, six months from now, a year from now? A and then you can accelerate all this and get um, estimated failure times, even though you only maybe actually test the goods for uh, a few weeks, that kind of thing. So it, it's different for different type of components. If you have a single integrated circuit chip, say in a plastic package, it's going to have different failure characteristics than, say, you have a very big, highly populated printed circuit board that has all these different kinds of components on it. So there's, there's not one easy bottom line answer to your question, right. but, but all of that can, can be determined with the right kind of testing. The answer to so many questions in our industry, it's almost a joke, is it depends. That's, right. that's really the, right. the answer, it really and it does. depends on a lot of factors. Yeah, and in fact, uh, to, to your question, one of the things that it also depends on, and Dan has alluded to it, is contamination. If, if a board populated with components is pristinely clean, it's going to last longer, all other factors being equal, in a, in a damp, uh, high-temperature environment than the same board that has uh, maybe uh, flux residues or handling residues left on it, or somebody uh, handled it with their sweaty fingers, you know, and, and left the salts from from uh, perspiration on it. And the problem with, I just mentioned it, because the problem with all that is it's awful hard to quantitate. Uh, and part and parcel of, of characterizing these kind of materials is actually determining how clean they are. Once you manufacture them, uh, there are analytical methods you can use to determine just how clean those surfaces are. And, and that's an important factor when trying to uh, 
control and mitigate uh, corrosion type failure. Yeah, um, IPC recently changed the uh, J standard, 001H, um, section eight of that standard, uh, to call for a new method of determining cleanliness. And the new method is uh, what they call an objective evidence standard. So there's not one magic number that applies to an industry as there used to be. Now right. it's, you take, a, you take a test coupon, uh, similar to your assembly in terms of soldering materials, reflow profile, component types, and you reflow it, and then you subject it to a 168-hour surface insulation resistance test right. under heat and humidity. Right. Right. Uh, and if the board, to your point, you're exactly right on. If the board is very clean, that heat and humidity is not going to, within 168 hours, result in uh, an ECM, electrochemical migration event. If right. the board is, uh, has residue on it, then it has a greater chance at failing one times right. 10 to the eighth, eighth ohms uh, within that, that time period uh, under that stress condition. So uh, I, was, I was given the keynote uh, address uh, in Amsterdam about a month ago uh, at the uh, Harsh Environment Conference and the SMTA Harsh Environment Conference. And uh, I, as such, I got to stick around for all the presentations, which I always love to do. And someone, I don't remember who it was, someone on the third and final day gave a presentation, and I'm completely paraphrasing what he said. But he's, he's like, guys, girls, the, the issue isn't moisture. Quit calling it moisture. The issue is dew. The moisture in the air in itself not problematic, although it is an influence to what could be problematic. It's, it's not when there's moisture in the air, it's when it, when it, when it condenses and, it gets and hits a dew point. And you know, you, you have, uh, you know, uh, put a board in, put a circuit board in a refrigerator and then take it out to a hot, humid day. You know, it'll, it'll be dripping, you know, j just like a, a Coke can or something, you know, in, this, in the summer, sure. it, just, it just drips fluid. Uh, it, it's, but it's the mo moisture in the air isn't the problem until it actually condenses on a board. But it, I think it's still a wise move to um, mitigate moisture, particularly in areas where there is measurable moisture in the air, because that at some point will hit a cold surface and, and has a greater likelihood to condense, and then the, the drama begins. Well, yeah, absolutely. And just to extend that a little bit, um, people who make uh, implantable medical devices, okay, uh, that are sealed up and have a little cavity inside, uh, they will tend to test these parts at 37 degrees centigrade because that's human body temperature. And when those things are implanted in the body, they never get any warmer than 37 centigrade. But there is such a thing as the, going from the factory to the pharmacy. <laughs> And when they do that, they're going to have to travel somehow. It might be on a truck. It might be on an airplane. And if they go to uh, colder climates or they go to 37,000 feet in a non-temperature controlled aircraft, those things will see dew point temperatures. So uh, we emphasize to people making those kind of devices that you better take that into account. If the device makes it to implant, it's in a benign temperature environment. Before it gets there, though, um, bad things could happen. And, and as a case in point, just another quick story, uh, I was on an airplane to California one time with an intermediate stop in Dallas in August at noon, okay? The plane pulled up to the gate. Uh, the baggage monkeys came out and started unloading the uh, belly of the plane and after a few minutes, they had a baggage cart loaded cardboard boxes that were very prominently labeled human blood. Well, that baggage cart sat there on the tarmac for the whole hour that we were parked in the middle of August at 12 o'clock. And I later went back and looked up the Dallas temperature. It was 108 degrees that day. Well, um, my point That would be is, a bad time to have a transfusion. Exactly. <laughs> Now, I, I don't think that blood was protected with dry ice. It could have been, although it didn't say so. But, but my overall point is, if you're making things and you have to ship them somewhere else, it's out of your control. And, and things are going to see times and temperatures that you can't control, and you need to take that into account You know, when you're preparing your goods uh, for shipping and for field use. Yeah. What, what do you, in your 
uh, recommendations. You know, well, first of all, to recap, we talked about uh, we talked about the the issues when when parts are going from the manufacturer to the distributor to the end customer. Uh, what are the best practices for uh, mitigating moisture within the transportation process? And then, what are the best practices for the assembler who receives these components uh, in terms of storage and um, and verification that the parts have not been exposed to, uh, uh, you know, a, a illegal amount of, of moisture. Yeah, well, there's certainly a variety of things that one needs to do, and, and it depends on part too, like like you said before, on on just what it is you're shipping. And that, I mean, it goes all the way from tiny little integrated circuit packages uh, to, as you said, populated boards. And the things like that is talked about, uh, even bigger things that, that just can't get wet. And um, uh, for things that will fit in bags, which cranes don't, but uh, plenty of electronic components do, the good practice is to put them in a moisture barrier bag, a bag that has very low water vapor transfer rate, include inside the bag a, a desiccant material, that has good capacity and that will absorb and take up and hold a lot of water in the event that somebody opens that bag when they should. Um, at the at the assembly end of things, um, here again, storage in a uh, dry box is key. Uh, best to uh, flush that dry box with dry nitrogen. Uh, when you open the door, don't leave it open too long because it will real quick come to equilibrium with the outside environment. Remember what your mother always told you at the refrigerator. Right? Exactly. Keep yeah, the door exactly. closed, yes. And, and, the door closed. and the, uh, there, there are people who, who don't um, follow these kind of instructions probably because of lack of training. I'm not really sure. Uh, we had a situation over in Malaysia where we had an assembly you know, sub-assembly facility, um, where people were supposed to leave doors open not more than 30 seconds to take stuff in and out. Well, uh, one day, apparently, they opened the door to take stuff out, and oh, guess what? It's uh, lunchtime. Let's go to lunch. So the door stayed open for an hour. Uh, it's, it's damp and humid in Malaysia, okay? And, uh, it's these kind of it's these kind of silly things that can cause a lot of troubles and the things that are avoidable. And the, one other quick comment: um, we talked about contamination. We talked about moisture. Uh, it's best to mitigate contamination, keep things as clean as you can. But but if you make things dry and you keep them dry, um, you can get away with contamination being present. So. So to me, it's making it dry and keeping it dry. It's the first line of defense. Yes, I would like the goods to be clean also, but uh, even dirty ones, if you don't get to a new point and you don't get condensation, you'll be okay. Yeah, I, I, when I teach courses on cleaning, I, I talk about the three guaranteed, three guaranteed ways to prevent ECM. One is remove the E, instruct your customers not to plug in the board, no electricity, right no ECM. Uh, one right. is to remove the moisture, uh, which right. arguably is difficult in, in every situation. Um, not impossible, but it's certainly challenging. And the other is remove the, remove the residues. And yeah. pick, pick which one is the easiest, um, you know, easiest to do, the least point of resistance, and do that one, whatever it is. Uh, not the first one. The first one's not, not good advice. Um, as, as we're finishing up here, Dan, uh, in terms of the general world of 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 uh, corrosion and moisture mitigation you know not just in the electronics industry but for the rest of the world since the rest of the world is a lot bigger yeah. than just our world what are some of the common misconceptions or mistakes people make when they think they're doing something right uh to to uh, mitigate corrosion whether that's a barrier or a desiccant or a, uh, a barrier you know, moisture is a big one um not paying attention to your environment, for example, you mentioned the Golden Gate Bridge, right? Foggy, sunny, foggy, sunny, right? But salty too, right? Yeah. So, for example, if you're around a gas station, 
there's a vapors from the fuel that contaminate. If you're near a lumber mill or a, a wooden pulp and paper mill, right? There's acid from the pulp and paper. Uh, so a lot of people run into, they don't understand where the contamination is from. I live in Florida. We have phosphate mines, which are very hazard, uh, you know, acidic, uh, tire plants. So they make this beautiful circuit board, right? Do all the things you ask it to do. And they put it in a plant that has high levels of contamination, high levels of moisture. And they think they're going to put a barrier over it and barrier their safe, their way out of it. But I, I see a lot of things cracking and failing and people trapping in moisture, right? So um, a lot of gun people trap in moisture too. So I think they need to let it breathe a little bit, okay? Not trap so much stuff in. So I think that's a misconception. If you just slather it with grease or you slather it with paint or a coating, that's going to solve your problems. I think it creates a lot of problems myself. Yeah, probably at best it defers some problems, but it's, it doesn't go away. The problem is still out there. Um, it, that reminds me of um, you know, your advice to know your environment, I think, is, is sound. In a slightly different context, but similar to know your environment, uh, is uh, the early days of LED lighting. Uh, and, and I'm a little out of my league here, but the, my understanding is the early days of LED backing, they used a silver backing material. Uh, and LEDs were you know, the promise of the future, which has been delivered upon. Uh, but the early LED lightings, uh, lights didn't last long. The promise was they'll last forever or they'll last 20 years, and they were failing rather quickly, particularly in certain geographies of the world. And one of those geographies was India. They were failing in record numbers in India, and this was due to tin whiskers. And then it was determined that the, uh, the, the silver backing material was reacting with the sulfur, the super high sulfur content in the air, and just you know doing what it, from a chemical standpoint, doing what it's supposed to do. It's like, oh, okay, I'm supposed to make ten whiskers, and it did. Um, now, obviously, when when the materials were chosen, they were they were tested in a laboratory, they were tested in a climate controlled environment, and and it, it was all good. And and then they got delivered to you know, various parts of the world that did not duplicate the climactic environment of a laboratory and, and things were not good. And the industry quickly realized what was going on and, and changed, the, changed the, uh, the, the materials and, and we don't have that particular issue anymore. But I think your point of know your environment is a, is a good thing. Um, I promised one other anecdote. I was in Singapore, this is several years ago, um, exhibiting at a trade show. We had all our equipment out. And the uh, convention center was actually a very large metallic building, right? Uh, and uh, it was, when we were setting up the show, it was hot and sticky because all the warehouse doors were open and this was Singapore. Uh, but then after the show, you know, just before the show started, the roll-up doors closed and, and the air conditioning came on and the air conditioning came on and it was very pleasant in there. And then late in the afternoon, it was super humid outside, late in the afternoon when the show closed, the final day of the show, first thing the organizers did was turn off the air conditioners because they were going to open up all the loading doors. So we had a, a chilly building with metallic structure, uh, so the metal was cold, and uh, they turned off the air conditioner and opened up all the doors. And, I mean, you couldn't see it, but you can imagine this wave of moisture just coming in like a, like a tsunami. And within probably 15 minutes of the air conditioner going off and the, and the doors opening, it started raining. And I don't mean drips. It started raining in the building because all of that warm, moist air hit the, you know, the 65 degree metal and instantly condensed. And it took quite a while for that metal to warm up, you know, from the outside air. And it rained for a good 15, 20 minutes. And people were scrambling, covering up their sensitive equipment. There were things like oscilloscopes and AOI machines and all this stuff out there that you know, really aren't designed to get wet. So you know, they had a dew point issue, uh, as we talked about earlier, which I thought was a great illustration because not only did the dew point create a moisture problem, but the moisture problem created a moisture problem because now that moisture was not just on the, on the surface of the ceiling, it was now flying through the air, landing on equipment. Yeah. That, that, that's, that, that's that problem, too, here at the Cape. 
with the vehicle assembly building. I don't know if you've ever seen it or been in it, but it rains in there uh, yeah. because of the size and the also the height, you know, the elevation of the roof. Um, and also, you were talking about sulfur and, and dendrites and that sort of thing. Um, there were some electronic components on boards in Sweden that were installed in a traffic control system, you know, traffic lights. And very quickly, they got, they started corroding. There were silver contacts on the boards that were started to get eaten up. Well, long story short, this installation was uh, downwind of a uh, power plant that burned coal. And, you know, the emissions from the power plant rode the wind. It got to that intersection in Sweden and took out their traffic signals. Um, so the whole corrosion thing is in Florida, um, but, uh, and you don't ignore that. But to me, the first line of defense in all of this is keeping the things dry uh, and do whatever you can with the desiccant, so with the steel camel material uh, to keep the water down. Because if you do that successfully, um, you can get away with some contamination or some materials issues that maybe you shouldn't have on your parts. That was another one. We had a client who had an enclosure again with silver that had silver switches. Uh, also in the same enclosure was an aqueous gel. And of course, aqueous gel volatilizes water. Well, after a few operations, his silver switches were corroding and the parts were failing. You don't put silver metal uh, components in a wet environment. That was a naturally wet environment that, frankly, there would be no way to control the moisture content. So it, it even goes back to design of products and making sure you're designing them correctly and then correct handling and handling them the same way every time. So a, a lot of angles to this. <laughs> and Bob, finally, um, if, if we have a, a listener who's, or a viewer who's an assembler in the electronic assembly space, uh, what relevant um, J standards or other standards apply to moisture? I have uh, J standard 33 and uh, mil spec 64, uh, 34, 64. Are those relevant standards or are they one of many? Uh, they're relevant, but they're very old. They're outdated. Mm. Uh, that, not that you shouldn't apply them or use them if you don't have any anything better. Those standards are prime candidates or um, being studied again and, and being modified and take into account, you know, the knowledge we have today, the testing methods that we have today. But, but those are the primary ones, and there are others also in JEDEC and also in the automotive industry that uh, don't come to mind right now, but um, if you like, I could pull those up and email it to you if, if that would be useful. That would be very useful, and for my listeners and viewers, um, if you look at the show notes, uh, I'll have that information that Bob sends me in the show notes. If you're watching this on YouTube, just look down where it says show more, click that, and you'll get that information there. I will also put in uh, contact information for both Dan Jenkins and Bob Lowry in case you'd like to reach out to them with uh, you know, a stump the chumps question or something like that. Uh, we'll, we'll put them to the challenge. Um, gentlemen, uh, Dan Jenkins, Bob Lowry, Lowry, I really appreciate your time and your expertise and your generosity in sharing your knowledge uh, with my audience and me. Thank you. Thank you for the chance. My pleasure. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to or watching the Reliability Matters podcast. Our episodes have been downloaded more than 35,000 times, and I remain ever grateful for your support and encouragement. Don't miss an episode. Listen and subscribe to the Reliability Matters podcast on your favorite podcast app or watch it on the Reliability Matters YouTube channel. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to click the like, subscribe, and bell icons to be notified when new episodes are released. We release new episodes on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. A special thanks to Circuit Assembly Magazine's PCB Chat at pcbchat.com and Ascendo Reliability at reliability.fm for syndicating the show. Thanks for your questions and episode suggestions. Please keep them coming. Send comments or episode suggestions to mike at mikeconrad.com. 
That's Conrad spelled with a K. Once again, thanks for listening to or watching the Reliability Matters podcast. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and perhaps most importantly, keep doing it right. And I'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.